friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here for my Monday this and that video for those of you who are new. This is simply a weekly vlog that I do to keep you updated on various different things, let you know what's going on in the garden, lead you back to old videos I have, or let you know what's yet to come. So let's get to the topics of today. And I'm going to start off by talking about spruce tip syrup. So I almost missed my opportune time to get spruce tips. A lot of them were already starting to get too big. Though the great thing about spruce tip syrup is you can make it from older spruce tips. You don't have to use the very young tender ones. Those ones are best if you're using them in baking and cooking, stir frying and more. And last year I did a video on spruce tips, their benefits and, and their uses. And I did try doing several different things with them. I added them to pancakes and bread and, and various other things. Didn't care for them as a side vegetable, but they are some ways to add some more nutrition. My two favorite things to do with spruce tips is to make a homemade soda out of them raw. So they're fresh and they have that wonderful flavor and it's fizzy and healthy. And then you know you're saving the vitamin C content in there because you're not cooking it. And then the other is to make spruce tip syrup. I find I really do like this. And then when I have this out, when we have company over and I'm serving coffee, they like to use this as a sweetener in their coffee. So I'm just gonna do a real quick rundown on this because if you go look online for spruce tip syrup recipes, you're gonna find a billion different ways to do it. There's the classic old fashioned way that is simply taking your spruce tips and then layering them in the jar, in a jar using approximately equal amounts of sugar and spruce tips. No need to weigh it or measure it. You just put in a layer of spruce tips, a layer of sugar, and you keep doing that. You can use organic cane sugar or you can use brown sugar. Brown sugar is a popular one for that. And then you just put a cap on it and you leave it for like, is it, a, I think it's a month, maybe longer. And what that does is the sugar will begin to pull the juices out of the spruce tips. And then uh, some people will just use a syrup right off of that when it's done. And then the sugar's definitely gonna be all dissolved by that point. And I, by the way, I'm including some pictures that I, I collected online. And then they just pour that off and use it as a syrup. And then some people will also cook it down to make it thicker. It's all going to be a matter of taste. Now, I did try that method, though I don't think I got any pictures of it. I tried that method second. And while it was quite good, the thing I didn't like about it is it pulled out more of the citrusy flavor of the spruce tips, which is fine for some things. But... I preferred the more the quicker method because it leaves more it has less of the lemony flavor and more of kind of a vanilla flavor which was really unexpected and so all I did was I took the spruce tips and use about equal measurements so in this case I was trying to make a bigger batch so I did four cups to four cups to four cups and that's water sugar and spruce tips but I started off first by making the tea without the sugar. So I put the four cups of spruce tips in a pot, added the four cups of water, brought it to a boil, and then let it simmer for quite a while to really pull the flavor out of the spruce tips. Now, some people will bring it to a boil, take it off the heat, and then let it sit for 24 hours. Um, I decided to just turn the heat down and let it really simmer because I didn't want to leave it that long. I wanted to get the project done that day. It was the same day I ran out and harvested the spruce tips from my other piece of property. Then after I saw the color, it's kind of a greenish gold color at that point. Then I went ahead and strained out the spruce tips, added my four cups of sugar, again brought it to a boil, and then turned the heat down to where it was it was constantly at a low boil and then stirring it frequently, checking the consistency and watching the color and then also watching the level drop down several inches in the pot. So it depends on how thick you want it, how much you want to reduce it. You can reduce it down to where down to three quarters of the original amount or even half the amount. It's going to be super thick if you take it down to 50% of its total volume from when you started. So if you had four cups of liquid in there 
and you cook it down to two cups, it's gonna make a pretty thick syrup. In this case, I'd say I took it down to about three quarters. It's not super thick, but it's thick enough just right for using as a syrup for pancakes or even just as a sweetener. But anyway, that's my preferred method. I like the flavor of it a little bit better, but either way is really good. And people have a plethora of other ways to do it. Just look it up online and see, and just compare the different recipes. That's whenever I'm learning to do something new, that's how I do things. I look at the first time I ever made tiramisu, which I don't know that I ever got a picture of, but I used to make it quite often was I compared a bunch of different recipes, especially knowing that mascarpone cheese is not something we can easily get here. So what were some other options I could use, which in that case, I used a one-to-one -one ratio of ricotta cheese to cream cheese to somewhat mimic mascarpone cheese, and it turned out pretty good. But anyway, I used that same method. I just, if ever I'm trying anything new, I look at all the recipes, compare, and then use the best elements or the things that I find to be the best elements out of each recipe and then combine those together. Especially if you don't have sugar maple trees to tap around you, uh, but you have you live in a place like we do that has a lot of spruce, then you can make a spruce tip syrup. You can also use pine and fir tips to do this same process. So anyway, it is a, a good option. I just, I actually still have the bottle from last year. I made two bottles last year and we finally used up the one and I still have another whole bottle left. Now the difference in color is the one from last year is a little more gold because I don't think I cooked it down quite as much as, as this one or I didn't brew the tea as long when I made it. But anyway, there's one option there. It's uh, just the cost of the sugar. It was really all that went into it because the spruce tri tips were free. And so was the water because it's from our rainwater collection. Okay, moving on, let's talk about a couple other things. So I've been dehydrating some more meats, trying to get some, uh, the last of the turkey from Thanksgiving out of my freezer. So I got that dehydrated up. I got ended up with two jars when I got done with that. Then I decided to try dehydrating some salmon. I already had canned up just to try it. Turned out great, by the way, nice and crispy, just like the, the turkey or the chicken. Even though I have a more detailed video coming out later, I'll tell you real quick how I do that to get it turn, to turn out more like freeze dried meat is you either can it first, pressure cook or pressure can it first, or you take the cooked chicken, turkey or fish and then freeze it for a day or two. There's something about the freezing process that changes the texture of it so that when you dehydrate it, it turns out very, very crispy. And that's what happened with the salmon because this was pressure canned. And then I turned around and right away used it in making a meal. So I basically made a tuna noodle casserole, except for using the salmon, the dried salmon instead. And it was really good. It turned out great. And it was so easy to use. And But the thing that surprised me was that I thought I was going to be able to take that whole quart of meat and reduce it down to a single pint jar. But it, it actually filled up a pint and a half. So I was surprised it didn't reduce down farther. Now it could have, if I had taken my tamper and really smashed it down or powdered it, then I definitely could have got it into a pint jar. But I really didn't want it in a powder. I wanted it to be in chunks, so I left it loose. Then I vacuum sealed this up. That's the important thing is you wanna make sure you always vacuum seal your jars of meat. And if you take anything out, reseal it or keep the jar that you're working through in the freezer and then you can just pull it out. You don't have to vacuum seal in between every use. But anything that's gonna go into your storage and it's gonna sit back there for any amount of time, make sure you're vacuum sealing it when it comes to any of your meats, cheese, eggs, and the like. And then a couple other things going on I wanna talk about is um, I've been getting lots of green onions. Late winter, early spring, I'll start buying uh, the organic green onions from Misfits Market, use up the green onion, plant the white part, making sure I kind of break up the root a little bit to wake it up, stick those in the soil, they start growing. And then they give me green onions for about six months. And I can just keep harvesting off of that, using them as I need, and then dehydrating up the excess. And then I mix it in 
with the Mother Earth products white onions that I get, the dried organic white onions. And I like the way it looks in the jar. It turns out really nice. It also increases the amount of onions I have on hand. And since I don't always get uh, reg the one year I did really great with Walla Wallas and red onions, I have not been able to do that good since. Our, just our summers have not been quite as nice. But I can get green onions and my walking onions, my Egyptian walking onions are doing really good. I'm still waiting probably until fall to start using any of those because I really want them to multiply and fill up the boxes out front. And then the extracts, a, a quick update on how these are coming along. So I've been tasting each one. I have to say out of the three, even though this one I still think is too sweet, I do like the honey and wine mixture better. So next year when I do this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use less honey and more wine to break up the sweetness. But this has an overall better flavor than the homemade wine by itself. And yes, you can use store-bought wine. I just like to specify I'm using homemade wine because I'm making the most of the things I grow. The grapes, the apples, the rhubarb, and the blackberries. I've used all those to make homemade wine. And I do that for, mostly for the, for the purpose of cooking, marinating and making extracts and it's a way I can save a lot of money. But you know, these are all actually pretty good. The rum, nice flavor, but the rum is just still to me is just too overpowering, especially with such a delicate flavor like lilac. It's great for vanilla extract, but just too overpowering for the lilac. So I'm finding this blend here to be best. And probably what I will do is once these are done, I'll combine them all together. And then the other thing I did after I shot last week's video is I took the very last of my lilacs after I was done dehydrating a bunch and just packed these full even more because after they sit, uh, like when I first started this one, the jar was full. But then if you saw last week, the lilac flowers were up to here. So then I packed a bunch of more fresh ones in there and then got it packed full and already now they're up to there again. So that's one way you can do to really help increase the flavors as it seems to make more room, pack more fresh stuff in there. And that can be with any of your fresh herbs that you're wanting to make some kind of flavored extract out of it, be it peppermint. I've made a peppermint extract using fresh peppermint and it turned out really good. But yes, you can just keep packing them in there. And I say leave it for at least a month. Usually my extracts I'll leave for two months just to make sure I'm getting as much flavor and nutrients pulled out of the herbs as possible. So anyway, I'll keep you updated on the lilac extract as it goes along. And that's just my update so far on those. And now let's talk a little bit about just a few garden updates. I'll probably be uh, focusing more on the garden next week, but just a few. My back deck, it's just looking more and more beautiful every day. It's amazing how when you get some warm weather, things just start exploding. But the last few days have been really, really cold again. It's crazy. We finally had to, we had to build a fire last night again crazy but it's still we're having a little bit warmer days it's just mostly early morning and night has been super cold the front deck garden is usually the first thing i do a, a flyby tour of because that's the first one that's really start starts to fill out and that's where i grow all my strawberries all of my strawberries in pots so i use the green stock and you can see here what one thing i did yesterday was i took a couple of sticks so that they were at least a good inch tall yeah, not obviously short enough to fit in the top of the green stock. Technically, you're not supposed to do this, but as long as your water can get through that whole top pieces, that's where you fill up with water. Well, if you prop up something so that the, the water can drain through there, you can put something on there. So this is just me doing this. So a couple sticks to prop up another pot because I always felt it needed something on top put another smaller pot of strawberries right on the top. And so I can water those and then put the water in the base at the same time. And that just extend, that just gives me another place to put strawberries. And anyway, so yeah, all along the deck, all along the edge, I've got mostly strawberries growing there, plus a few other things like some green onions, some calendula. I do have a pot of lettuces started there that you, but you won't see anything in there. They're just teeny tiny for some reason again this year having an issue getting lettuces one of the easiest things ever to grow but for some reason i'm having an issue getting those to grow for me second year in a row i don't know why so bizarre but i'm at least finally seeing some starts out here and a few out back 
Oh, and my tomatoes in the greenhouse, you know, because it's been staying nice and warm in there, even with these colder days, they're doing really good. So, of course, I'm excited about that, like always. Uh, potatoes are doing good. Ro rhubarb's doing great. My currants are exploding. Like, they, they always do good. I can always depend on my currants. But the one thing I wanted to uh, show you, last year it was, somebody had sent me some lovage seeds. So I planted them, got quite a few plants actually. Not as many as I thought I would, but did get several. One of them I think I lost, but I still had three. And I gave one to a friend and then I kept the other two because I, from what I understand, they can get pretty big. And so here's a couple images of what they look like now. So they've come back. They are perennial. They're related. They're very similar to celery. You can even see by the leaves, they look similar to celery. And they have a taste of celery. And I know lovage is one of those things that's at, towards the top of the list, just under capers, at having high amounts of quercetin in it. So something to consider there. So I'm really excited about the lovage. And thank you to the person who sent me those seeds. And then one little tip I haven't thought to say is that last year, Patrick got me a digging fork. I had never even heard of a digging fork, never seen one before, but he picked it up for me thinking I might like it. And I have to say, I love it. So I'll put a picture here so you can see what it looks like. Depending on what you're digging, uh, like if you're trying to dig up weeds and grass that's really embedded itself in your some of your garden areas, I highly recommend the digging fork. So much better than a shovel because of the way it works. It has more flat tines as opposed to your pitchfork that's not only curved, but each tine is cylindrical. These are actually flat and they're shorter. So it works really good for digging up grass, creeping buttercup and the like out of your garden, especially when you're trying to dig it up out of areas where you already have some perennials growing and you don't want to dig those up too. So if you don't have one, that might be a good tool for you to check out for your garden. And I like the fact that it's shorter and I'm a very short person, so it's a lot easier for me to use than a lot of the shovels anyway. All right, now let's talk about the collaborations coming up. So I did just have the dehydrating collaboration published, but I was watching it and I realized, oh, I, I said we were going to start with the arts and crafts one. No, I've decided we're not going to do that. And I did think of another collaboration that we were going to do, and that is going to be the canning collaboration. So we had a dehydrating collaboration, so putting up dried goods. Now, so the next one's going to be canning. So this can be water bath or pressure canning and the same, the same idea. You can, uh, I recommend when you take your pictures, if you have any of the items, let's say you're canning carrots or green beans or potatoes. One way you can consider doing it is setting some jars out and putting the, the fresh items next to it so it makes it obvious what it is and it just looks nicer that way. Or even consider taking pictures of your setup, the canned goods in the canner or again, having some pictures. You can do concession pictures. I usually take up to three pictures per person. And then you can put them in succession so that we can see, okay, here's the here's the before product, here's the, the process, and here's the finished product. That's another idea. Or you can take three photos of three completely different items. And don't be in a hurry to do this because I'm not going to close this out until August. I want to give people plenty of time to do their canning and to start taking some photos and then don't send me any photos until you know you've got the the photos that you want for sure to go on the collaboration just start taking photos and then when we get to that time I'm going to close it out at that point you can select your favorite photos you can send me more than three but I'm most likely only going to use up to use three per person and then um what you'll do is you'll send those in one email, not three separate emails, not four or five separate emails. Make sure it's in one email that's titled canning collaboration, and then I'll drop that into a folder. I may not even look at the pictures right away. I might just drop it right into the folder and then come back to it later. So um, again, I want to specify, do not send several different emails. Make sure it's properly titled. And if you're participating in the other collaborations coming up, don't send those all in one either. They need to be separate emails. 
So Canon collaboration will be the next one. Then the next one after that will be the garden collaboration where you take photos of your garden stuff, whether it be a windowsill garden, a deck garden, a whole backyard garden, a whole field garden, whatever it is that you have. So again, start taking those photos now while things are growing good. And then when I, that one I'll probably close out in later in September to give people plenty of time to get lots of great photos and then pick their favorites. So nice, clear, clean photos so people know what the images are of. So these videos are pretty fun. I do enjoy putting them together, even though they're the most time consuming videos to put together, they are still a lot of fun. I love the whole community interaction and the way it inspires other people, whether they're already doing these things or not, it either gives them new ideas or just inspires them to just get going in that as they see how many people are doing these very things. So anyway, can collaboration and then if you're taking garden photos, you know, when it comes to be that time, you'll send those those photos in a separate email titled garden collaboration. Then maybe after that, we'll do the arts and crafts one. So, um, but I'll give you more details on that as the time comes along. All right, well, that's it for my this and that for the week. Any thoughts, ideas, comments you'd like to share, please put those in the comments section down below. And thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.